Live from the internet, it's the Dr. Tom the Frog Show! Hi-ho! This is Dr. Tom the Frog here with the Dr. Tom the Frog Show where we talk about RPGs! Uh, now, I, again, we've got another great background by Jeff Brown. Uh, you should check out his Patreon. He's an amazing artist. And, uh, and, and now we are going to bring on our special guest. Now we have. I'm super excited because this this guy. He's been on um, one of the Batman movies, and he was also on Three Musketeers. He's on the NCIS. We have Chris O'Donnell. How are you doing, Chris O'Donnell? <laughs> if only I could only uh, dream of uh, living up to such a name. Uh, Chris McDowell. I'm afraid, just me. Oh well, the chisel good lucks threw me off. I'm sorry about that. Um, yeah, that's it. Yeah, it happens all the time. Don't worry. No, oh, understand. Okay, well now. Uh, now, I understand you've got a game about the adventures and trials of moving into a nursing home, right? It's called Into the Old? Yes, that's right, Into the Old. Um, it's the lesser-known sequel to Into the Odd, which is probably the more well-known game that I've done. But, uh, yeah, we're, we're doing all sorts of spin-offs. Uh, so Into the Old is uh, the current one. Oh, really? Now, I've heard that you've got in development uh, one about uh, rotting food called Into the Mold? Into the Mold, yeah. Uh, Into the Plot is uh, going to be based around sort of being a London policeman. Um, I am stealing these from various people who've come to me with these names already. I can't take any credit. Oh, well, what can you take credit for? Into the Odd, what's the deal? Uh, Into the Odd, I can't take credit for. That was me. Um, Into the Odd is a uh, adventure game designed to be very, very rules light and to bring more of a focus back onto exploration, problem solving and investigation. Oh, so I, I understand that uh, you've got a free version and then if people really want to spend money, you've got a paid version. What's the difference between the free and the paid? And yeah, The goal was for the free version to have everything that you need to play. So you've got how to create a character, how to play the game, um, how to get started, and if you want to run the game, you'll probably want to buy the complete version because that's got the referees, guidelines, and so on. You know, you've got a lot of random tables on your blog, uh, Suga Games. Have you ever thought about making a random table of random tables, like pool table, card table, dressing table, communion table? I've thought about this. What do you think? Yeah, I could write that down, because a lot of the times you sort of... How many times have you said you enter a room and there's a table? But you could do with a random table table, couldn't you, really? Yeah, talk about something really yeah. odd, huh? Yeah, do I have to credit you for that if I use that idea? Uh, absolutely. Ah, okay. Well, I mean, you can you can get all the monies, but I just want oh, to... Oh, okay. Credit. I'm only about the money. That's fine. I understand that with all this table work and, and other game designs, that you just had so much that you decided you had to do a Patreon. Now, so to, what, what's, your, what's on your Patreon? So the idea behind my Patreon is I write maybe sort of between 10 and 20 blog posts a month and I don't want to ask people to pay me to do them because they're something that I want to do anyway. So I'm always going to do the blog posts. But we just finished my first month of Patreon and the sort of pledge money that's coming through will allow me to put them into a compendium, commission some artwork, commission some good layout work and maybe do a print run of a compendium. So it's basically taking what I've been doing on the blog and it's going to be just getting a more professional, if you like, uh, release of that material. Oh, that sounds pretty fun. All right, how, are you excited with the Patreon? Or how's it going for you? I am. I'm amazed at the amount of uh, people that have taken it up. Um, you know, you throw these things out there. I thought Patreon's pretty low risk. It's not like doing a Kickstarter. Um, and yeah, I've been absolutely amazed by what's come through. So I'm just getting the first month's money through. So it's very exciting to be talking to artists, some of whom I've worked before, some of whom I've not worked with yet. And, um, yeah, it's just just really exciting time because, like you say, it just allows you to explore some things that I wouldn't have been able to ordinarily do without any budget. Oh, well, then congratulations. I'm glad that's working out. So, Thank you. I want to talk – I'd like to step back to Into the Odd there. Um, you're seeing, people say that it's pretty different from your normal OSR game, mostly from like the backdrops and the setting. What, what is it about Into the Odd that makes it stand out in your mind? Well, it's two things, really. The, the main focus of me making this game was that I 
loved some of the stuff that was coming out of the OSR, but I'm really not a huge fan of Dungeons and Dragons rules. I find, for my taste, they're just that little bit too crunchy. Even the old basic versions, which are compared to sort of newer editions, are very basic. Um, I still found there were a few little rules in there that I just felt I didn't necessarily need. And it all came from one time I played a game called Searches of the Unknown, which is a one-page uh, Dungeons and Dragons with very minimal rules. And I found myself having almost as good a time as I would playing a more complex system. And I wanted to make something very, very simple that had those really streamlined rules of something like Searches of the Unknown, but also the sort of richness of a full game, if you like, like Dungeons and Dragons. And um, the way I try to do that is by including all of the setting material within the game rules itself. So I don't really have um, pages and pages of background about the world and its history. I try to just sort of get that character and flavor across through things like random tables and things like the starting equipment list. And I've heard someone describe it as sort of baked in to the actual product, which I quite like as a description. Yeah, I, I, I like that too. And you get guns, which is awesome. Yeah, and the other thing was um, moving to sort of an industrial setting. So obviously moving away from the traditional sort of medieval fantasy. There's no orcs. There's no wizards as such. Um, it's an industrial setting, perhaps more akin to the 19th century. Uh, so yeah, you get guns, which is good. Which And with it having more of a horror focus, I think guns have a nice way of giving people a sense of when a gun doesn't work against a monster, you know that it's seriously time to start thinking about what you're doing. But which would probably be running, right? Yeah, that's it. And I mean, out of the there's there's only a few sample monsters in the the book, but a lot of them aren't the type of things you want to be firing guns at. Hmm. Now you can pretty much just use any like you don't have to do any conversion. If say you had a monstrous compendium of an old game, you could just use that and into the odd, right? Yeah, well, what I've tried to do is I've tried to make it so that if I gave you a description of what a monster is, you would be able to very quickly make the numbers that you need, because all you really need is you need three ability scores, hit points, and an attack at the basic level. And there's some guidance for how to do that very quickly. So if you tell me that you want to have a... Um, give me a D&D &D monster. Oh, uh, I, I don't want to be brought down by copyright, so I'll go Adyag. Otiog. Um, if you gave me an Otiog, I, I wouldn't necessarily want to go and dig out an old monster manual and convert the numbers of an Otiog. I would instead look at the Otiog and think, right, where would this fall on this scale and this scale and this scale and just be able to make it up very quickly. Which isn't something that sounds particularly easy to start with, but I've tried to make it as easy as possible in this system. Oh, cool. Okay, I kind of like taking the spirit of a monster and then just reincorporating it, as long as it's quick and easy. That, that sounds fun. That's it. There's a lot of people that get sort of bogged down in, you know, a troll has to have six hit dice plus six for it to be a troll, which, you know, that's not what people think of when you remember a game with a troll in. You remember it regenerating from having its arm cut off, and you remember it acting a certain way. And that's what I think is more important about a monster. Yeah, plus it's really long nose. That That's what I always remember about trolls. Yeah, rubbery nose is obviously the key. Yep, that's 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 my touch that's, that's touchstone really. No size is my touchstone for monster creation. Yeah, that should be just right there, top of the entry. Enough about, enough about tables. Enough about all this crazy game monster making. I've got a serious question for you, Chris. I've got a serious question. Are you ready? Okay. Are you are you ready for a serious question? I'm ready for a serious question. All right. All right. Would Monty Python still be funny if they had American accents? That is a good question. Um, I'm not a traditionally a Monty Python fan, but I did see their revival thing they did recently. And I think the fact that Mike Myers was involved sort of drew me out of it. And I wonder, oh, is Mike Myers Canadian? Am I just about to offend hundreds of people? Millions You're of people? You're about to offend a dozen Canadians. Oh, right. Well, I think his mere presence dragged it down slightly and some of the it must have been some of the American radiation coming from him having spent so much time adjacent to America so no I don't think it would be as funny if they were American 
All right. So to, being Canada being the hat of North America was infected by the radiation of America and then brought down Monty Python. That's a, an excellent premise. That's your quote, not mine. It is. It is technically my quote. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> All right, well, what are Young Ones? Do, do you, are you a Young Ones fan? I am a huge Young Ones fan, yeah. I love, All right, uh, Ada serious question. Would Young Ones still be funny if they had American accents? No. All right, there you have it. Are we going to keep going until we find someone who would still be funny if they had American accents? I don't think accents? we can. I, I think... No. That we, yeah. You're picking very British things there, so... Are there any British comedy troops that would still be funny with American accents? Um... I'm trying to think of American adaptations I've seen of British comedies, and it's not a good list. No. No. So, sorry, I might have to pull the plug on that one. All right, the plug is pulled. Well, Chris <laughs> McDowell, thank you so much for coming on the Dr. Tom the Frog Show. It was super great having you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tom. You just watch the Dr. Tom the Frog Show. And we hope that you liked what you saw, yo. But if it was a big waste of your time, well, it's free, so that's not a crime. But if it was a waste of your time, yes, it's free, so that's not a crime. <laughs>